we got some goodies in the mail. So what's in a box? So we got two airbag cups and we also got two mounting plates for the lower control arms. And this is gonna help us mount our airbags in the front of this Chevy S10 frame. I am using some Slam Specialties airbags and these bags are top-notch quality. I'm trying to figure out which one of these bags would be a better fit for our front end because that's where most of the weight is going to be with our um, LS-based V8 engine. These two are 7-inch bags. They are RE7s and this right here is an 8-inch bag. It's an RE8 and you can actually tell the difference is actually somewhat significant between the two even though this bag is only an inch bigger around than these two. I'm not sure if I can get this large bag in there, but I will try. And the reason why I want to run with this big of a bag as I possibly can is I want this truck to ride like a Cadillac when everything is said and done. My understanding with airbags is the larger the airbag, the less of a pressure you have to run to get the bag inflated. And the less of the pressure you're running, the smoother your ride is going to be. So now let's go ahead and take the suspension apart and see what all would have to do to make these airbags fit in there. I'm not planning on using these original brakes nor the rotor, so I think I'm just going to go ahead and get the stuff out of the way permanently. And eventually, as this build goes on, our brake system is going to end up looking something like this. Oh man, this is going to look great once this day comes. With the spindle out of the way, the next step would be to remove the shock and the spring, but I don't have a spring compressor available. Man, this spring came out flying. Luckily, my legs were out of the way and this thing did not touch me at all, so we're good. All right, so with everything out of the way, this plate, will go in here like so and I'll have to uh, either weld it in place or you know run a couple of uh, bolts through this lower control arm to get it all secured in place and then we have this cavity going up that's where the spring and the shock used to be now the scup is gonna go right in there so I went ahead and put the washer and a nut in here just to secure that cup in place and yeah so it just kind of sits there like so and a bag gets sandwiched between the plate and a cup well obviously you know it's not bolted in place but you get the idea so i'm starting to kind of get an idea of how everything is going to come together but before i move any further with the airbag install i'm actually going to go ahead and remove the upper control arm the lower one i'm going to get everything wire brushed, painted, old worn out bolt joints will get replaced and the same goes for these old tired cracked bushings because once everything is said and done I want this thing to ride like a brand new vehicle I think I finally solved the mystery of how old this frame is. I was doing some looking around and I came across this little stamp. So 6.5 of 87. So that makes this frame 33 years old. Cool. Well, good to know. And if you look at these uh, rubber bushings, yeah, they look like some 33 year old bushings. These things are worn out, shot and cracked. And I bet all of these bull joints are probably all original to the vehicle. This is our new bolt joint and the only way for it to end up in this lower control arm is to get pressed in from the bottom. That's how the original bolt joint got pressed in. So in order to get it out, we have to do the process in reverse, meaning we got to press this bolt joint out down that way. And I'm going to use this bolt joint press set that I rented from my local auto parts store. 
So to do that, we gotta use this tube adapter that's gonna slide over the bottom part of the bull joint. And then this adapter right here actually slides right into the bottom of uh, the press. That's gonna go in like so. Now the press is gonna go in. Now this adapter slides right over the bolt part. Now we're ready to start wrenching and I'll use my impact gun to make things a little easier for myself. And here's our old tired beat up bull joint. So the bull joint is out. Next step would be to remove these worn out bushings. I just got done removing these bushings from the other lower control arm. And I gotta tell you, there is definitely a learning curve. I've noticed when I was removing both of the bushings that I had to bridge the gap between these two walls on both sides because otherwise one of these walls would start bending as I tried extracting the bushing and obviously that's not what I want. So I just got this uh, bolt and a nut got it pretty close to where it goes in there, nice and snug. Just like that. And also one for the other side. These bushings got pressed from the outside in, so in order to get them out, we're gonna be pushing them outward. That worked out pretty good. When it comes to upper control arms, the procedure for the bull joint removal is gonna be a little different. This bull joint is not pressed into the control arm, but it's actually riveted on, and there are four rivets holding it in place. I believe the easiest way would be to actually take a grinder and just grind off the tops of the rivets and this bull joint should pop right out. It took me about five minutes to grind down these rivets. The only problem with using a grinder wheel is it creates a lot of dust in a process. Especially if you are in a garage, this dust is gonna settle all over your tools and things inside a garage. So it's best to do this sort of thing outside. But there's also another quicker and a dust-free way of removing these rivets. And that's using an air hammer. Let's go ahead and see how fast I can pop these off with this blade. So that took about 20 seconds and there was no dust. Now let's get these bushings out. To make the bushing extraction easier, I will go ahead and deform the metal bushing sleeve to break the bond between it and the control arm. Great, so the control arms got totally stripped, but there is just no way I'm gonna be putting these control arms back on looking the way they do because they look pretty bad. With all of the rust and dirt and grime and everything on them, they have definitely seen better days. So I'm gonna go ahead and get these repainted. However, before I can paint them, I have to strip all of the dirt and all of the rust away down to a bare metal. So basically, I want to end up with something like this. I went ahead and actually used a wire wheel to get all of this uh, rust and everything off. But you still can see a little bit of rust here and there. And uh, there are a couple of pockets on the underside where my wire wheel just could not reach. But I gotta tell you, to do this right with a wire wheel, it took me probably a good 40 minutes just to get this thing to where it is, and it's still not finished. So I think to speed up the process, I'm gonna use my pressure washer sandblasting setup. Tools being used for next step are, first and foremost, we need a pressure washer, and it's recommended to have something with a little more power. This one's a 3600 PSI, four gallon a minute output. Then we obviously will need our blasting medium, and my medium of choice is black diamond coal slag. 
So basically all it is is crushed up coal with probably some sand and whatnot mixed into it. But this stuff is great. It's inexpensive and I've used it with great results in the past. Then we have a pickup tube that basically just goes into the bag and sticks down into the medium. And then the medium gets drawn up through this hose all around and it ends up in this mixing head that's connected to our pressure washer wand. Coal slag or sand gets introduced into the stream of water that comes through the wand and it gets mixed in this head, comes out at a great pressure and blasts all the dirt and rust away. This way of blasting is pretty good because as you blast there is no dust whatsoever because everything gets mixed with water and just ends up on the ground. And another reason why this setup is great is because you can blast things that are big. You can get the whole car blasted on the outside and obviously you cannot get a vehicle into a sand blaster unless your sand blaster is the size of a paint boot. This is the same exact setup I used when I blasted my cab and it only took me about an hour and a half to get everything nice and clean and rust free. Hey, I may look silly, but this is winter, it is cold, and I'm not about to get soaking wet. This is the result that I'm getting after only about 15 seconds of blasting. This thing really works fast. All right, so all of the blasting is done and everything looks great. There's some pitting on the underside, but that's not a problem, not at all. And then, yeah, you see there's some more pitting down in the cup area down here, but once again, that's not an issue because after our airbag mounting plates will go in, I mean, all of that's gonna get covered up anyways, and it's suspension, so it wasn't really meant to be pretty, but it will still look good after everything is primed and paint it so uh, let's get on with that so before I weld these brackets in the last step I want to do is I actually want to apply some primer to the inside of the control arm and also underside of this bracket and since this bracket is getting welded into this control arm I'm going to use some of this weld through primer The suspension is part of the car that sits lowest to the ground than the rest of the vehicle, especially the lower control arms. And the underside of the lower control arms, I believe, is what gets the most beating from the, the rocks, the pebbles, you know, the sand and everything from the roadways. So I want to make sure that the finish that I apply to the suspension will have the best adhesion to the metal. And that's why I'm going to start out with self-etching primer. Now what is self-etching primer? Basically it's a primer that has some acid in it and then as this primer gets applied to bare metal that acid is really gonna eat into that metal and that's what's gonna really make this primer stick so this way the new finish will last longer and keep the rust away that much better and after primer I will go ahead and follow up with a couple of coats of this black paint
Everything is painted and looking great. I left all of the parts outside for a couple of days so the paint could cure all the way. And now I'm ready to press all of the bushings and ball joints back into place. The tolerances between the bushing and the recess within the control arm are really, really tight. And a couple of coats of paint and primer do add up to some thickness. So I decided to send away the paint and primer from the recesses and also to apply some lubricant that will help keeping the rust away and also it will help the bushing sliding back into the control arm that much easier. I want to try out another slightly different approach to uh, press the bushing into the control arm. Now I am going to use one of these spacers that came in with that ball joint press because it slides onto the rim of this bushing just about perfectly. For this approach I'm going to use a vise. Hope this works. Now the rod will pass through. One thing to note, by design the flared out part of the upper control arm bushings does not sit flush with the control arm like the bushings in the lower control arm did. And installing the ball joint into an upper control arm has got to be the easiest part of this whole suspension rebuild. And that was just super simple. In the next video, these original Chevy S10 rotor and a hub and also a Beltec 2-inch drop spindle will get modified to accept these massive 14-inch rotors and the Corvette 6-piston calipers. It's going to be a pretty interesting process, so guys, make sure to tune in for that, and I'll be seeing you in that video here pretty soon.